Hello, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if it's okay with everyone, we're going to not use the podium, but uh, switch back and forth over here at the desk. Um, my name is Lisa Johnston. I work at the University of Minnesota Libraries. I'm the research data management and curation lead for our data repository there. And I am Wendy Kozlowski. I am a data curation specialist at the Cornell University Library. I also coordinate our campus-wide effort for um, research data management services. We are both a part of the data curation network, which is uh, what we're hoping to talk to you a little bit about today, introduce you to it if you don't know what the network is, and give you some updates on what we've been doing in the last year or so. Um, sorry, we'll get the technology figured out here. <laughs> So to give you an idea of what we hope to uh, engage you in in the next hour or so, like I said, introduce you to what the DCN is, and um, at the same time kind of introduce you to why, or talk a bit about why we think data curation is important in this bigger picture of data management services. And then we have four main um, things that we want to um, talk about that the DCN has been focusing on over the last year or so. And then we hope to leave time at the end to get your input and ideas on um, this idea of collaborative support for research data management. Okay, so first, what is the Data Curation Network? Um, we are a collaboration of 14 institutions representing nonprofit and academic data repositories uh, that actively support research data sharing. We launched in 2016 with funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and have really, uh, in the last year actually, um, uh, moved into a sustainable member-driven organization. Our mission uh, for the Data Curation Network is to really curate data ethically and in ways that make them fair. Um, and we do this through advancing curation best practices, uh, through offering training to uh, develop the data curation profession. And as an organization, we really want to grow sustainably and responsibly uh, to really best serve our members. Um, before we go into how we're doing all that, uh, we're just going to pause here to take a moment to establish why data is so important to the scholarly communications landscape. Um, and you really can think about this as, as two, two big problems, um, data sharing on the one hand and research rigor and data reuse on the other. Uh, data are critical for reproducibility, increasing uh, public trust and transparency, um, enabling new discoveries through reuse, reanalysis, uh, or extracting, adding, and building off of existing data. Uh, this example is a, a really good example of data sharing. Um, this is uh, just a few days ago from the CDC. Uh, showing the number of uh, COVID sequences that have been shared uh, just here in the U.S. actually. There's a number of other repositories doing this similar work. Almost two million uh, COVID sequences that are available uh, for public access, use, and analysis. Um, on the other hand, there are still barriers. So even with something as large and uh, you know, impacting as COVID, where we all agree that open access to this research and the data behind it is essential, uh, this is a recent analysis um, that looked at preprints and used text mining to identify markers for open data and open code. And um, the authors are still finding that the, uh, the prevalence of, of that open data is pretty low. Um, so looking at archive, uh, they showed about 13% of the sample, uh, only 13% of the sample had open data or open code markers. And that went up a little bit for bioarchive, um, and then back down to about 15% or 12% uh, for, for SOAK and uh, med, med archive. So we're, we're really showing that even though we agree that data sharing is really important, there still must be barriers preventing this from happening, happening successfully. And I will note um, that, that the authors, Collins and Alexander, also mentioned that this is substantially higher indicators of data sharing than pre-pandemic. So there are numerous challenges, and uh, they're listed out, a few of them here, on both sides of the equation, uh, both for sharing data, really thinking about what data do I share, 
Um, are, what repositories might I use? Um, what are the privacy challenges or sensitive challenges for sharing that data? And then how do I reuse that data? Can I understand it? Is it, is it reproducible? Um, can I even find it? So all of these issues are things that data curators, data librarians, data stewards, uh, there's lots of ways to call us, but we are all working collectively to try to really bridge this gap uh, between researchers trying to share their data and others trying to reuse and test the rigor of that data. We do this through data curation. And we try to facilitate reuse and long-term access to data. In particular, data curators try to be the first users of that data uh, as we're, we're working with it in our repositories, we're working with our um, researchers to make it accessible. Um, we will check the data for missing files, for missing documentation. Uh, we'll look at it through the lens of you know, privacy issues. And we're doing this work in collaboration uh, with the researcher. And what I propose is that we also should be doing this in collaboration with each other. And, and that's really what led us to launch the Data Curation Network. Um, today we're a community of about 40 plus data curators who uh, work together through interest groups, uh, through um, developing educational resources called data curation primers, uh, creating opportunities to learn from our peer organizations, and just really be a platform to share expertise, tools, trips, tips, and tricks for data curation. So now um, let's shift to some of the highlights of what we've been working on, particularly over the last year. Um, so the Data Curation Network really does strive to enable uh, ethical and fair sharing of data. Um, and we recognize that most data repositories are receiving a wide range of different data types. This is a variety of different file formats. Um, you know, you're receiving different code types, you're receiving uh, different software packages, packages. You are also seeing a lot of diversity in the type of discipline that the data are generated from. That is a lot for one institution to handle, and um, my institution at least can't hire the expertise needed to cover all of those formats to really do curation at that expert data level. So the Data Curation Network creates a shared staffing platform to really allow for data sets to be matched with the experts that have that specialty in that data format, in that discipline, and we really work across our institution to provide that broader layer of data curation support. We do this by really trying to seamlessly uh, introduce the Data Curation Network into local repositories or your repositories' existing workflows. Um, so all of the repositories that are partnered in the Data Curation Network all have their own ingest mechanisms, they, all have their, they run their own data repository platforms, they provide their own storage, they do their own appraisal and selection, that's all um, locally happening. Um, when it comes to the actual review and termination of the, the fitness of that data and, and recommendations for how you might want to really augment that data for findability, discovery, or reuse, that's where the Data Curation Network can step in. And we will match that up with a curator across our network. Um, they will make recommendations and then send those recommendations back to the local repository. So this really happens as a seamless microservice, if you will, uh, within your repository stack. And it integrates across all of our different repository platforms. Um, one way we do this is by training our curators in a standard protocol. Uh, we call these the curated steps, conveniently enough. Um, and these really allow us to provide consistent treatment to data across many different formats. Um, and very particularly, we always want to include the researcher in that process. And that's the, the request step there where we're looping in that researcher to some of the, the findings that we've made around this particular data set. And we work with them to implement those recommendations and then move that back into the repository. Now, one of the key things that we wanted to talk about uh, that we've really focused on in the last year is really thinking about how to look at our, our work through a racial justice lens and better incorporate inclusive and equitable data practices into our work. Um, in this last year, we were fortunate enough to work with Dr. Faye Cobb-Patton, who is a computer science researcher at NC State, and who worked with us to facilitate engagements with our network 
um, to identify key areas where we as curators could really incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion principles into the workflow that we have. So we evaluated our curate steps and we really uncovered the fact that there are many unwritten steps that we as curators take uh, when we evaluate data and we, we do a lot of that work kind of in the background and we really wanted to try to surface the ethical considerations that we as curators are making, um, particularly when it comes to sharing data about our human participants. So for example, um, curators at our repositories, when we receive data that has uh, been derived from human, human participants, we will request the consent form uh, for you know, what that uh, participant agreed to, how uh, was it described to those participants, how the data might be shared. Occasionally, and probably more often than I would like, uh, the, the participant form actually doesn't say a lot of clear things about how the data will be shared. And in fact, sometimes it actually suggests that the data will not be shared and that it will be kept confidential forever and ever. So we really need to try to push back as curators to really uh, you know, recommend that the researcher needs to either go back and reconsent all those individuals, um, give them you know, a better awareness of how that data is gonna be shared and really, you know, the researchers want to do the right thing here. They're trying to make decisions based on what their, their funder and their journals are requiring them to do, but also we need to update our practices from the beginning when we're working with human data, human, uh, human participant data. So um, we took a look at our steps and we also looked at a number of uh, wonderful peer examples that really brought in a lot of the ethical components that we found missing in our current workflow. Um, we looked at the fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics in AI uh, work, FATE. Um, we also looked at the care principles, which really looks at how to handle indigenous data. Um, we looked at the ACM's fairness, accountability, and transparency work, or FACT. Um, and then finally, the wonderful um, Urban Institute's principles for advancing equitable data practice. All of this uh, really led us to rethink our curation workflow and really explicitly build in the ethical components that we as curators say that we do and, and, and we, we talk about in our training, but we need to really write that down and be very clear and explicit about how we are evaluating data for, for sharing and the, the, the individuals involved and the communities that are impacted um, through that sharing process. So uh, this is all uh, work that uh, a subgroup of us has been taking a look at, and we're, we're going to be hopefully releasing uh, the updated curate steps uh, in January. And that is actually really important to, uh, to us because of my, my next update, which is really um, building out our community of practice. Um, and for those of you who, who might not be aware, the, the DCN, or the Dedication Network, is, is unique in the fact that we really want to extend our training beyond just our curators uh, within the network. Um, we really want to open that up to uh, really develop the broader profession of data curation. And so uh, one of the ways we do that is through a two-day workshop uh, that we've hosted with uh, funding from the IMLS. Um, we offered uh, uh, three out of four of the planned workshops right before COVID um, and reached over uh, 80 participants who um, came you know, came to the sessions, had active opportunities to work with data, work with the curation process. And one of the things that was an outcome of each of these sessions is that we um, got people together for a capstone project where they would create what's called a data curation primer. Um, they would work in teams uh, of two to five individuals working over uh, a six month period to really research and develop out what are the specific steps that you might take for a particular format. And you can see all of the outputs from these workshops on, on the slide here. So we've, we've developed about 24 of these resources that are um, really helping curators jumpstart that process if they might not be familiar with a particular data type. What we're hoping to do um, with this uh, next project uh, is to take that idea of you know, matching um, a group together, uh, a group with specialized expertise together with a problem um, and, and taking that a little bit broader in, in the research data lifecycle. Um, so uh, something that we're working on with Ithaca SNR uh, is this uh, idea of a data communities workshop. 
Um, Ithaca uh, put out this wonderful report uh, in 2019 describing data communities as these fluid and informal networks of researchers who share and reuse a certain type of data. Most, but not all, of these data communities are facilitated through uh, a website or an online repository. And a key thing is that data communities are not the same thing as a discipline. They're really working around a shared problem. Um, uh, one example of a data community um, might be uh, Flybase, for example. So the, the group that really comes around a particular genome of one species and, and really work on that together. Uh, COVID is another really great example. Um, what the research that Ithaca did showed is that these communities really need help building out uh, or identifying existing repository infrastructures. Uh, they're looking for technical and policy advice on metadata, vocabularies, preservation, privacy. Um, they want guidance and uh, advocacy for their financial sustainability. And most importantly, they're really just trying to reach other researchers in their community. And we really felt like the data curation network and data curators more generally can help with a lot of those problems. So um, we, uh, we got an NSF grant to use the workshop model to really try to incubate data communities. And through an application process, uh, we have selected 14 different data communities to work with uh, that will be represented by researchers from that community to come together. Uh, we're holding this workshop in February of, of 22 to come together and match them with uh, data curation experts in that area, either due to their expertise in the domain or file types they're working with or some of the other challenging issues that that particular data community is looking at. So we're really going to hope that our, our shared staffing model for curation and workflows for data repositories can extend itself uh, throughout the research data lifecycle. So Lisa has already mentioned one research project, and while at its core, the Data Curation Network is around curation, um, it really provides, because of its collaborative nature across these multiple institutions, a really unique platform for us to explore some of these ideas of interest in research um, projects that we have. So there are a couple more of this, these that we would like to talk to you about. Um, and this one kind of is twofold. We wanted to take a look at, you know, we as um, outward facing librarians think curation is really important. It's very valuable to us. But do we really have a, a concept of how other stakeholders in this area feel about curation? So we did a couple of projects around assessing the value of curation from two different perspectives. First, from um, repositories outside the data curation network and then from those who are depositing content into the repository. So we're going to start with the side on the left here. And, oh, this would not be the right screen to switch. So <laughs> this project um, looked at uh, four key research questions. Um, <clears throat> what level of curation are data repositories providing at this snapshot in time? And of those things that they do, what do they feel are the most um, valuable? And then what kind of impacts is that actually having downstream on the data? And how important is that to the larger um, net, uh, environment around data sharing? And then this is not, this, there's not a cost to, there is definitely a cost to data curation. So does the effort that we put into doing all this data curation, um, it may, is it worthwhile? Does the benefits uh, outweigh that effort? So to get at that first question around levels of curation, we had to define what it is that we were talking about. So we were all speaking the same language. So we defined for the purposes of this survey, four levels of curation. Of course, it could be that you're not doing any curation whatsoever. That would be what we refer to as level zero. Um, and the level one curation is at the record level, working our way up through file level curation where um, the curators would open up the documents or open up the um, package, the data set package, review the files, and perform um, file formats um, 
transformations if necessary to be sure that they're, um, have, they're accessible. Um, one layer up from that, level three, would be um, making sure that the documentation is adequate and allows for um, reuse and understanding of the data. And then level four curation is where the curators are actually going in, opening up the files, running code if it's there, uh, making sure that the files interact in the way that the researcher expects them to in the platform that they expect them to do so. Um, the survey was designed and intended to collect responses from U.S. institutions. Um, we adopted a non-probabilistic sampling technique, so we knew that only research uh, rep data rep institutions with data repositories were likely to respond. But we recruited um, participants from multiple listservs and email lists. Um, Due to that, we realize that there is a risk of bias and some data skew due to higher levels of curation for those who are likely to respond. And we recognize that this is a, a limitation when we go to generalize our results. Um, the survey was open to collect responses for three weeks during January of this past year. So we had... Um, over 120 responses in total. We did, however, because of the listservs that we sent to, got some responses from um, international repositories. The data that we are analyzing excluded those responses, which um, left us with 95 um, respondents in the United States. Um, the data analysis that we're presenting was conducted based on overall responses, um, not at the individual repository level, because we had multiple responses from some repositories. Most of the respondents were repository staff, as you can see. We also had some um, responses from directors and a few from actual data depositors and repository users. Um, they are mostly associated with disciplinary and institutional repositories. And like I said, because it did not limit the number, the survey didn't limit the number of responses um, from an individual repository, Places like um, Dryad and ICPSR and a few other really large repositories did have multiple respond responses. Um, taking that all out, there are 59 unique responses, and um, the responses were spread out over um, 23 states within the U.S., both some with um, core trust seal certification and 11 actual DCN um, member institutions. So we're going to present here just a few of those results. Um, looking at that first question that we addressed, wondering what level of curation is actually happening within data repositories in the U.S., this chart, chart shows the different levels of curations per, curation performed according to the responses. Um, this question did allow for multiple responses. Um, they're not necessarily, even though we developed those um, one through four, um, they're not necessarily hierarchical in their um, levels for the curation actions. But most um, often, curation is being done at the record and documentation levels. You can see over 75% um, of the respondents res um, had levels of curation at that um, uh, responded at that they were doing that level of curation. We went on then to consider um, how often they're actually doing this. We can say um, we offer this as a service. Um, we have the ability to do this, but for the data sets that actually come into our repositories, how often are we doing it? So we looked at the frequency with which those different levels of curation were actually being performed. And we can see that um, basically all levels, levels one to four, are actually performed most or at least half of the time for 70% of the participants that responded. So it seems that um, most of the repositories in our sample are fairly committed to these curation actions and efforts, and they're doing them with the majority of the data sets that come in to their repositories. So we also presented the survey respondents with a list of curation actions. I think there are 30 curation actions that we presented to them and asked them 
to specifically identify the frequency with which each of those actions was being performed. <clears throat> and as you can see, there's a, there's a lot here. You don't really need to be able to read all the words. But if you look at those orange boxes, you can see that um, the most common curation actions were happening over 90% of the time around checking for duplicate files and review of the metadata um, and documentation for both accuracy and quality and completeness. On the other end, we see that um, closer to 30, 35% of the repositories were only um, performing, regularly performing the action of actually going in and editing the data for quality and accuracy. Um, and that, so those things are happening much more rarely than some of the other ones. And we also took a look, remember we had respondents from both um, disciplinary and institutional and generalist repositories, and that we did see a statistical difference between um, curation actions <clears throat> using um, you know, means, co comparison of means using MATWINDU. Um, the results could be explained by the fact that these disciplinary repositories um, have a different set of skills that are much deeper than those being offered by um, institutional repositories. Remember, these are not all responses from DCN network repositories, so these are just how the individual repositories are performing these actions. So some differences between institutional and disciplinary repositories, specifically in these areas. We also presented the survey respondents with um, a statement that data curation adds value to the data sharing process and that data curation outweighs the effort and cost of data sharing. And the majority of respondents did agree with this um, statement. According to them, data curation impacts primarily on the ability to, for people to find understand, use, access, and preserve the data. And those are the most value added um, actions taken by the repository. So we hope to have a paper coming out about this, and it's going to go a lot more into some of the lessons learned and takeaways, but um, I think it's really interesting that there's a vast majority of the repositories, the data repositories currently in existence that are providing this kind of data level of curation. That's a lot of work. Um, and despite that amount of work and investment that they're giving to their repositories and their curation actions, um, they believe that it adds value um, specifically around the idea of finding, understanding, and using the data. Again, there are some differences between disciplinary and institutional repositories. Um, however, we do acknowledge that this was a survey around the perception of the value that their work does on the data sets in their repositories. And we're not actually sure how that reflects around um, attitudes and behaviors outside those who responded. Um, also, it was really interesting to see that when we had responses within a single repository, um, that individual perceptions about the practices that were done at that repository didn't always match. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think would be another project, more money. Um, what would be how you could get a more authoritative answer around this, around the actual practices within a repository that are going on? So look for those in future um, iterations of the project. Um, so I mentioned the other side of this was that we wanted to take a look at what the users of our data repositories actually feel about these curation actions that we're requesting them to take. So the second um, research project related to this, um, actually I should mention, um, a subset of the Data Curation Network um, universities participated in an end user, what we refer to as an end user survey. Um, and we sent out um, an 11 question survey between April and June of this year to anyone who had submitted data sets to our repositories who are doing curation 
um, between January of 2019 and March of 2021. And you can see here that while responses varied slightly between institutions, we had great response rate of 40%. Um, before I came to work in libraries and had never done a survey in my life, I would have said that 40% was an awful response rate, but I've learned that actually is a pretty good response rate, so we were pleased with that, and that um, represents 227 responses across those six institutions. So again, just a couple of um, interesting pieces that came out of these, this work. Um, can't see my own numbers there. Uh, almost 90% um, of the responses either strongly or somewhat agreed that they were satisfied with the curatorial review that was received and the data sets that they submitted. Um, and of those, um, the vast majority of data sets that, had, that went through the curation process had changes made to them. And they felt that because of that, that they were more confident in sharing their data, and they're more comfortable, comfortable and confident in sharing their data. Um, and because of that, now I guess we can't say the because of that, but that another question that we presented with them, them with was, um, do they felt, did they feel that the repository added value to this whole process of data sharing? And it was overwhelmingly positive. Over 95% said that they either um, agreed or strongly agreed that this process added value to the whole, um, the curation process added value to the data sharing process as a whole. We also, in that question around what value was added, had some free text responses. And um, there was, this is just a subset of some of the great things we heard back. Um, but you can see in that middle one that um, they really felt, for example, that even though that they um, had thought about this a lot, that the process itself was um, a still a learning opportunity. What is it that others might need to know and should be included in the metadata in order to increase the utility of their data set for the long term? Um, this was repeated over and over again in the free text responses that this concept that um, having an outside set of eyes outside of the research project itself look at the documentation to make it more understandable was extremely valuable. Um, so getting at that last question, so we realized that they all, or they, people agreed that it added value to the creation process and um, was it worth the effort? This is kind of really getting down to the nitty gritty. And again, um, over 90% um, strongly or somewhat agreed that even though this added an extra step to the data sharing process, that the um, curation was definitely worth the effort. And again, we had some um, free text opportunities in this question as well, and we had a lot of free text responses, over 100 people gave um, free text responses. And again, lear my process of learning how to do surveys, I realized that free text is not something you always get, even though it seems like a, an easy thing. And I think that this middle one, again, is really interesting. Um, this, it gets at this idea that the, these actions that this outside set of eyes, these expert curators, are able to um, make the process more comfortable for them um, and that they would use the service again. So um, continuing on on the, some of the work that the DCN is doing as far as research, we also have um, recently received an NSF eager grant um, to look at, um, look a little bit deeper into what the actual practices and costs are around uh, data sharing. So this grant was awarded to um, the Association of Research Libraries Cynthia Hudson Vitali is the PI in the project. And again, a subset of the Data Creation Network institutions um, are involved in this work, um, all bringing um, perspectives from those institutions, which we hope um, to be able to, to express as something useful outside of just those in the Data Creation Network. And we acknowledge that this idea of looking at um, specifically practices and, and 
and costs especially has been looked at before. This isn't something brand new. People have tried to look at this before. And so part of this project also um, involves uh, an advisory board from uh, with including members of other institutions outside of the data curation network as well as COGER, AAU, and um, APLU. So for this project, we're looking at four, um, three main research questions. So for those people doing funded research, um, where are they sharing their data and what kind of metadata and of what quality is the metadata that is going out with those shared um, research data sets? Um, and how are they figuring out and making decisions around where they want to share and what content um, they're sharing with their, um, with their data sets? And then what is the cost to the institution? What different pieces um, come into play when evaluating um, the, the actual um, cost of the, sh the public access to share, um, data sharing? So in order to get at those questions, we have kind of a three-step plan, which is presented here very linearly. And as we are working on the project, we're discovering that it's not going to be linear whatsoever, but it's a nice visual. Um, we want to um, take a look at um, using metadata, public metadata records, assess um, data repository use within, and all of this work is within five specific disciplines that are listed here. Um, we want to then also perform a retrospective study of the actual data practices um, that faculty are using to develop um, service and infrastructure-based functional models for how public access is actually taking place on our um, campuses. And then finally, we're going to um, use all that information, um, do some survey groups or um, interest groups and conduct some surveys to collect financial information on expenses related to public access and hopefully be able to pilot and test existing financial models for this public access. Um, all of this should be then um, relatable outside of, I mentioned, the institutions that are participating and, and have it be useful as a way to, for other institutions to answer the same question, these same questions. And what we hope this work will produce is um, information on where researchers are sharing their data, um, which may allow for creation of workflows to support and fund those practices on our campuses. And by building those functional models, um, creating and documenting case studies, and collecting costing data, we hope this work will provide new information um, for making data-informed decisions for what the researchers actually want for services and infrastructure. Um, it will uncover knowledge about decision-making processes for research data sharing, um, if they're willing to share a, what it is that they go through in this decision-making process, and allow us to therefore um, create a public body of knowledge for practices and costs associated with public access to research data across a beginning set of disciplines and domains. All right. Um, the fourth highlight uh, that we wanted to share with you um, is really how are we really structurally able to do a lot of this work? Um, and you know, what, what is the, the data curation network as an organization? Um, so I'm just gonna touch a little bit on, on some of the, the models that we put into place uh, to, to try to achieve sustainability for this kind of collaboration, this, this multi-institutional collaboration. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the Data Creation Network uh, launched in, in 2016 um, with planning and implementation grants from the Sloan Foundation. Uh, we actually have kind of a go live moment in, in January 1st of 2019 where we, we really started that shared curation model. We got all of the technology and training in place to just kick off uh, that, that shared model for curation. Um, and then over the last three years, you know, we've really added um, additional members uh, in a very um, uh, controlled way. Uh, we, we really wanted to try to scale this up very slowly and intentionally uh, so as not to grow too big too soon. Um, so we, we went from six partners uh, starting out in 2016 to today where we've got 14 partners. 
Um, and this year, 2021, is really where we've been able to transition into a membership model. Um, and that model uh, relies on a new governance structure that we put into place. Um, so we've got a, a governance board that includes representation from each of the sustaining member institutions. Um, so each institution has a representative, uh, and this group really thinks about the strategic directions of the data curation network, um, really focuses in on what are, what are our values as, as a community, um, how do we really live those values, and um, uh, consider you know, projects and, and uh, work that really aligns with that. Um, we also have a small executive team that meets weekly to uh, really address any questions that come up on a more you know, immediate basis. Um, and we've got a wonderful advisory board uh, consisting of individuals, um, mostly from, from the member institutions, uh, leadership at each of those institutions to really help us figure out where to go next and what, what is on the horizon that we need to be paying attention to and, and work with. Um, we, uh, the membership model itself is, is really reflective of all of the operating costs in the data curation network. Um, we've got one full-time uh, assistant director uh, salary. We host an annual event, the All Hands meeting. Uh, we actually worked in um, uh, travel costs into our, our membership model to um, really, at least uh, for this year, wisely protect some of those travel funds uh, so that our, our attendees would be able to, to still go to some of these events because that in-person networking really has been a key component for the data curation network. Um, this is all uh, fiscally homed at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so we've been uh, the lead uh, PI on the grant uh, since the beginning, and that transition uh, staying at the University of Minnesota was uh, sort of a logical choice at this point. Um, we, we really uh, didn't want to um, lose all the wonderful services that are in place at a, at a university and try to go it alone, uh, at least not at this moment. Um, and then one other structural element here uh, represented on this slide is just the fact that we really uh, recognize the different types of work that we're doing. Uh, some of it fits in uh, sort of a committee type model, um, the, the maybe uh, ongoing curation work that's happening, um, a lot of the structural issues around how do we scale up our educational programs, that's all, all happening via committee. Um, but we also recognize that there is room for others to join us, and, and that's where we, we've developed these special interest groups. And, and that's where a lot of the, um, the research is happening, where uh, we've got groups coming together to talk about um, issues around handling big data. Uh, you know, how do you really move data around at your institution? How can we uh, learn from other peers around this particular problem? And so that's where our, our DCN community is, is open to others to come and join us and, and continue those conversations. And that's been a really fantastic way to really keep in touch with our, our attendees from the workshops or, or just really reach out beyond just the, the DCN membership. Um, I mentioned uh, we do have a membership model in place. Uh, so this actually uh, went live this year. Um, we uh, onboarded those 14 members at the sustainer level. That's where um, all of our members are right now. Uh, so they're each paying a, a $10,000 um, per year annual fee plus in-kind. And that in-kind is really the engine that drives the data curation network's shared staffing model. So we do um, have uh, the curators contributing between 1% to 5%, up to 1% to 5%. Uh, percent of their time. We actually are very careful not to exceed that time. Uh, we track that very, um, uh, uh, we, we track that in a, a tool called JIRA. Um, we also are experimenting with other, other ways to get involved for institutions. You know, we obviously are currently represented by a lot of larger institutions um, and maybe uh, more, more well-resourced or more well-staffed for curation. Uh, what would that look like for an institution that maybe has just one person doing data or zero people uh, working on, on data curation and, and really wanting to you know, become a part of this network. So we are beta testing you know, a different member tier that would allow for uh, you know, working with the network but maybe not with the same kind of staffing commitment or, um, or even maybe the, the curation uh, aspects at all. Um, the ambassador tier is really where we would like to host more workshops uh, in the future after um, 
we're doing in-person workshops again. Uh, so really getting an opportunity to take some of our training uh, to different regions and um, you know, really upskill around data curation best practices. And um, we've tinkered around with this idea of a sponsorship tier as well that might help cover some of the costs for all hands meeting. Um, and, and again, we, when we are doing those again, uh, that would be where we're going with that. So just to uh, kind of wrap up here, uh, what can you do to get involved? Um, well, you could join as a member institution. Um, we uh, have been doing an application process so far. Uh, we are you know, still trying to grow slowly and really thinking about bringing on institutions that help us fill some of the curation gaps that we have. So we really um, are seeing a lot of data sets coming into the network. Um, that have significant code components uh, and a variety of different software languages. So really looking for institutions that could pr provide some of that expertise that we might be lacking or that we might be um, over-utilizing in some you know, core individual's time. Um, we also want uh, to really extend our training, as I mentioned. So inviting the DCN to come in and uh, provide our specialized data curation workshop, uh, setting up opportunities for uh, the creation of additional data curation primers. That's really benefiting you know, the entire community. Um, and then those special interest groups are open to all. Uh, we've got a list of them on our website with different contact information uh, for all the different topics that we're looking at right now. So uh, some takeaways here. Uh, we think, you know, building off of, of what we've been doing the past several years that when it comes to providing data support and data services, collaboration across institutions is really key. Um, these problems are not unique to your institution or your researchers. These are uh, problems that we, we all have and we can really approach them as a, as a collective um, and be more successful that way. Uh, shared outcomes really drive any collaboration, and for us that means better research data, uh, data that is more understandable, more usable, and ethically shared. Um, and we recognize that this happens and this benefits us regardless of institutional origin. Uh, so data being shared at Cornell is going to benefit my institution and my researchers as well. So that's why we can all kind of get on board and collectively do this together. Um, we know, however, that there are definitely uh, some barriers to making all this happen, and that's what we wanted to do today is just kind of open it up to not only your questions about our talk, but what are some additional barriers that might be preventing us from really collaborating at the radical scale that we're trying to do, um, and what would, you know, what would we really need to do to help uh, make that possible? So with that, we will uh, close out our talk and invite any, any questions. Thank you so much. That is a full-time job. <laughs> we, we have a, a, a full-time assistant director that really is um, taking a look at how often we are asking our curators to curate those data sets. Um, so we use JIRA, as I mentioned. Uh, we ask all of our curators to log the time that they spend on a particular data set. And so far, uh, our our capacity, um, we've stayed within our capacity. So as I mentioned, we've got about 40 data curators. Um, any given time, you know, we'll see like four or five data sets go through the data curation network for shared curation. Our institutions are handling a lot of the data curation still locally. Um, they're, they're not, you know, sending everything to the data curation network. They're sending, well, the hard ones <laughs> to the data curation network. Um, the other thing we do is we, we talk to our curators a lot. Uh, we, we do annual um, partner check-ins with all of our members and we sit down and talk to the curators about their feelings about that workload. How, you know, how often are they getting tapped? Is that okay? Um, oh, and one other key thing. At the end of the uh, workflow, it, it, we use JIRA to track the curation assignment. Um, we ask them at the end of every curation assignment, how did that go? 
Was this the kind of data that you'd like to receive in the future? Did this match your skills and expertise? Did you feel confident curating this data set? Um, and we've really found that if, if you give me a data set that fits within like the file formats that I'm extremely expert at and the discipline that I love and care about, I'm gonna have an awesome time and I'm gonna be excited to see the next data set. If I get a data set that comes to me that is of a, a file format I've never heard of or maybe a software type I know I don't have the expertise, I'm gonna be a little bit more cranky about that. So we really try uh, to, to stick within what people are, are really feeling expert in. I also might add from the other perspective around load bearing, the other benefit of the network is that we don't necessarily, um, institutions aren't submitting just because they're lacking the skills to curate a specific data set. It also helps us load bear locally if we just have too much coming in at once. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm perfectly capable of curating this data set, except that I'm also curating six others because we each have limited capacity as well. So it isn't just about the skill set, but being um, having the flexibility to, as needed, push those data sets that we might be able to handle otherwise to the network, and they have more capacity there to handle those. So that has also been um, really beneficial, and thus far hasn't impacted the capacity of the network itself. Hi, Maggie Farrell, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Can you speak a little bit to how you work with research offices and maybe um, information technology offices within a university, not just the, I'm assuming it's mostly libraries, but could you talk a little bit more about the institutional commitment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, one of our working groups is, is really looking at that kind of campus advocacy piece of how we communicate this, this curation type work with others on our campuses, not just the researchers, um, but those in IT and the research offices. Um, I'd say it's happening pretty similarly at, at most of our institutions where there is often uh, a campus-wide group thinking about research data or cyber infrastructure issues. Um, you are right, most of the, the members involved are in the libraries, are based in the libraries, uh, but not all of us. And, and that's actually one of the exciting things that we really wanna try to expand on is, is really uh, working with um, groups like the, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, for example, who are really bringing a perspective that is um, you know, different from, from our library perspectives and hearing about their dedication challenges, which are quite similar, uh, exactly the same, um, and, and really expanding uh, the, the types of, of partners and individuals involved in this work. So um, I guess it's to say that there's that, that is happening at, at all of our campuses. We do um, try to compare how we are going about it and compare the different types of campus infrastructures for collaborating with IT. Um, and we wanna bring in those voices uh, as much as we can. I think one thing that we're learning in being able to do that together is trying to figure out the best way to communicate to those different groups. It's very easy for those of us who kind of in a very insular way, look at data curation and, and throw out these words and activities and say, we're gonna curate your data. But if we wanna get the message that this is a service that could be advertised through the Office of Research, for example, what are what is the terminology that represents or that um, resonates with that group and with the people who they talk to, which could be the researchers, but it could also be, for example, research administrators who may not have as clear of an understanding of the whole process of what goes on during curation. So being able to talk amongst ourselves about um, that, how to communicate what it is that we're doing with these different groups who might not need to hear it in a different mm -hmm. voice or using different terminology. Um, I wonder if you could uh talk a little more about your relationship to um, specialized repositories or specialized platforms that are repositories plus offering other analysis sorts of services. I'm thinking in particular of some of the things that the um, National Institute of Health um, is funding these days. Um, those 
are often pretty well funded and, and have a support package around them of, of staff associated with that. How do, how do the members of your network relate to researchers who are or perhaps should but don't know about these platforms? Um, so taking the latter half of that question, I think that um, of the, at least the academic um, institutions that are a part of the network, all of us have the practice of the, the very, that, that idea of appraisal of whether the data set is even appropriate for going into our repository. And the very first step is, is often to have that conversation with the researchers mm -hmm. and make sure that um, there isn't a place that is more appropriate or um, being used more commonly with their peers. And I think that that happens outside of the network itself. Um, and we've, um, a lot of us have educational information um, locally to, to express that. As far as the DCN's interaction, um, you may be able to speak even more to this than I, but um, one of the other things that we offer the community of curators um, is a, um, we make an effort to speak regularly with these groups. So we have had um, you know, Portage come and work very closely and explain their practices. We have had um, conversations with the National Library of Medicine. We have talked with um, the Woods Hole Group. Um, oh, the frictionless data. Frictionless data. Yeah. Trying to, to talk and learn from mm -hmm. all these different repository platforms and efforts and groups that are working on um, similar efforts. What is it that, that we can learn, not just as a network, but that the curators can bring home and implement pieces of at our home institutions? And, and I'll, I'll just add that I, there is a gap, you know, between um, when, when people in our role are reviewing a data management plan, for example. And the data management plan might describe, you know, utilizing a specialized data repository or disciplinary data repository. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're advocating for those repositories at that moment. And then, you know, three or four years passes and they actually share the data. Um, and we're often not brought back into that process. We, we could be, we are an underutilized resource there where we could be working with them to curate the data for really any data repository um, and preparing that for, for uh, going to those data repositories. But we're just often not looped back into that process. So I think it's a real, it's an interesting problem of how you could utilize this, this group of experts who, who really do have a vested interest in making sure that data uh, reaches a, a, a trusted destination and is, is well used. Um, but we're, really, we, we only see that data if it's coming to our local repository, right? So I think we need to find better ways to insert ourselves into that process. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, we'll certainly be hanging out if you wanna uh, uh, talk to us later, but thank you so much for coming and um, we really appreciate your interest. Thank you.